I'm super grateful for the opportunity to uh, speak on what is known as Transfiguration Sunday. And so turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. Uh, this is the lectionary passage for the Sunday, 2 Corinthians chapter number three, the gospel passage, uh, which is really the way in which the, the lectionary speaks about Transfiguration Sunday, gives us this record of Jesus leading his disciples to a high mountain in the days and weeks leading up to his uh, arrest and crucifixion. Uh, Jesus leads his disciples up to a high mountain and begins to pray. And in the course of this praying, he literally, the scripture says, transfigures. He exposes the internal glory that uh, has been literally held within his flesh, within his human body, uh, in a way that uh, was demonstrable, in a way that was fantastical, in a way that was uh, out of the ordinary. And all through the history of the church, this idea of Transfiguration Sunday uh, has been baked and cooked into our lectionary because it is a reminder to us that no matter what is happening in our life and in the world, God is always willing to reveal God's self to us in ways that we perhaps are not fully prepared for or have yet to experience. And it is in this way uh, that I hope that you and I and all of us uh, prepare our hearts because as we uh, traverse through these very perilous and troubling times, uh, we continue to be horrified by all the many ways that uh, violence and war uh, have overtaken and overran certain parts of the world. Certainly this uh, wickedness that is happening before our eyes in uh, Ukraine with uh, the despot uh, Putin, who uh, seems to be playing uh, so much uh, wicked footsie with Donald Trump and many of uh, the political followers of Donald Trump in this country, this rise of authoritarianism, of totalitarianism, of, 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 of a, a form of governance that is about brute force and brute violence uh, has rushed into the country of Ukraine. And, and we also know that there have also this week been uh, bombings and, and military actions in, in other parts of the world that include parts of Palestine with Israeli airstrikes and parts of Yemen and Afghanistan and Somalia. And so all of us, I think, have this consciousness, or at least we should, that we serve the Prince of Peace, but far too often the followers of Jesus have our hands dripping with blood. We are a people who are too easily given to war and violence, and this violence and war done by too many Christians in the name of the government, in the name of your ideology, and er certain times even in the name of your theology. Uh, it adds up to a certain kind of public witness that leaves, I believe, the gospel uh, in peril of being outright dismissed by the unbeliever, the non-believer, or the skeptic. It is in the midst of all of these realities, child of God, that I do believe the revelation of God, the transfiguration of Christ in our lives, this idea that God wants to show you something you've never seen before in your own life, in the life of your children, your family, your community, your marriage, your relationships, your neighborhoods, our nation, our world, even within yourself, God would want to show you and I something. And dare I say that if we ever needed a revelation before, we show enough need one now. Second Corinthians chapter number three, verse number 12 then reads, Since then we have such a hope, we act with great boldness. Not like Moses, who put a veil over his face to keep the people of Israel from gazing at the end of the glory that was being set aside, but their minds were hardened. 
Indeed, to this very day, when they hear the reading of the old covenant, that same veil is still there since only in Christ is it set aside. Let me just give you a quick background. This uh, is uh, the Apostle Paul, many believe, recounting and, and excavating uh, a, a, a story that is captured in the Torah. When Moses went to the top of the mountain after they brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, Moses received the law and the law, the Torah, the Ten Commandments was literally carved, as the tradition says, uh, by the finger of God into some tablets. And Moses was the receptor of this uh, divine uh, set of principles that the children of Israel were uh, committing to living out. And Moses' encounter with God in the, the, the process of receiving these tablets, Moses came off the mountain with such a glow. Amen. He redefined a soul glow. Amen. Redefined this holy uh, encounter that had such a glow that Moses literally put a veil over his face because it was so bright that uh, it was very difficult for folks to engage with him without being overwhelmed by his, his, his glow and or distracted by uh, this encounter, the physical manifestation of the encounter Moses had with God. And so Paul uses this whole uh, knowledgeable uh, story for the Corinthian reader to help them to understand that our boldness that we have driven and fueled by hope ought not to be treated like Moses did when Moses put the veil over his face to cover up the glory that had literally impacted him. While Moses was content in covering the glory so the people would not be overwhelmed by it, uh, the writer is saying, we now, fueled by hope and acting with great boldness, are not to cover our faith, our hope, our generosity, and our boldness with a veil. We must live out loud in many respects this hope, this boldness that drives and fuels us, right? And so one of the great first takeaways of this text on this morning, in a time when revelation is needed and wanted, perhaps God is calling some of us to remove the veil, the cover uh, that many of us may have over the hope that drives us, the boldness that literally causes you and I to act and faith and love and obedience to the spirit of Christ. But let's keep reading because verse number uh, 15 or 16 says, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. And now the Lord is the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is liberty, some scriptures uh, translations say. And all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us come on and say thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So uh, I, I know I gave you a little bit of a mini uh, kind of point and sermon getting this thing going, talking about removing the veil. Uh, but I want to go a little bit deeper into this theme around the role that veils play in our life. I want to talk about misconceptions, deceptions and revelations. Misconceptions, deceptions, and revelations. Come on, put in the chat. Don't miss your revelation today. Don't miss what God is trying to show you. Come on, let's pray for a few moments. God, we want to say thank you, Lord, for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide your word in our heart so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest upon me and even the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, let the people of God say amen and amen. Misconceptions, deceptions, and revelations. I wonder if you have ever had a conviction, a belief, uh, a certain uh, presupposition in one season of your life, one season of your journey, uh, one 
season of your sojourn, if you will, that the longer you lived, your perspective on that matter changed. I wonder if you can be honest about this human uh, uh, truth, if you will, that the longer you live, the more information you receive about certain things that what you thought as a child, when you get older, you may say, you know, uh, I've changed my mind about that thing. I mean, have you interrogated the ways in which sometimes our convictions ever become so strong uh, that for many of us who have been born and raised in uh, you know, religious settings, we can at times be the product of lots of deep catechism, lots of deep uh, indoctrination, if you will, a worldview that helps us to make meaning of the lives we live and all of the various experiences that combine to make our reality. But I want to submit to you, child of God, that there is a process that you and I must excavate, must bring to the surface when it comes to how we make sense of what God is doing and showing us in the world. That for many of us, what I learned as a child, I may not have much responsibility over. But as you grow and as you become more mature, it is our responsibility to make sure where we started is not where we end. Amen. Amen. Where you start is not where you should end. That you and I, as the scripture says, uh, ought to study to show ourselves approved unto God, people who are not ashamed to rightly divide the word of truth. That knowledge has levels to it. Wisdom has levels to it. And even in this text, the scripture proclaims that glory has levels to it. And that for many of us, we can find ourselves trapped in a framework of knowledge and information that can literally truncate or cut off our ability to grow beyond that beginning place. And it is no pejorative, amen, to talk about where we began or how we began. Because just like uh, the greatest artist and the greatest uh, uh, performer, the greatest athlete, uh, no one starts off as an all-star, as a, 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 a all-NFL, a, a, a top 75 performer, a Grammy Award winner. How many of you know that it takes some time to cultivate the gifts and the skills and the specificity that makes your talent, that which has been given to you, uh, something worthy of great honor. Well, I do believe that we, living in this very perilous age, are being called to interrogate and to ask ourselves, what are the misconceptions and the deceptions that block our revelations? What are the places in our lives that keep you and I from asking the greatest inquiries of our God because we may believe that some things have already been settled. I mean, I look at the, the overt patriotic nature of our culture, uh, how you know individuals in this country, largely evangelical Christians, uh, find themselves seduced by a certain performance of, 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 of patriotism, of loyalty to a flag or to a country, when in reality, it seems to me that there is a myth, a story about America that causes many of us to buy into a certain exceptionalism that says this surely could not happen to us. 
Amen. But if COVID-19 has taught us anything, that it has taught us that there are gaps and there are challenges and there are information uh, bubbles that can literally cause our country to look at the same information and come to radically different conclusions. And while different conclusions are not necessarily a bad thing, how many of you know uh, the conclusions when not able to be reconciled peacefully can actually cause the fraying of norms that make our lives unintelligible. And this is why I do believe it is so important for you and I as we try to discern and understand all of the experiences happening both domestically and internationally, both personally and communally, both as relates to our mind, our body and spirit. What is it that God is trying to show you? What is it that God is trying to introduce into your life, my life, our lives that can help us not just walk with God through the hardness of our circumstance, but walk through these times with God being the one to help correct our misconceptions, to help us confront our deceptions and allow us to embrace our revelations. I want you to understand, child of God, that when you and I can walk with God and embrace that God through the course of our life, through the course of your struggles, through the course of your difficulties, God is always trying to help you get a better way of interpreting and conceiving your reality. While there may be some folk who would like to use your experience as a bludgeoned object to beat you into submission, God would want you to have a whole different arrangement about why, what, and who, and where is happening in your life. Uh, and, and I want you to know that it is not to be taken for granted that just because I'm walking with God that I don't carry misconceptions. How many of you know that there are a whole lot of folk walking with God in Scripture that couldn't figure out what God was up to the first time, the second time, the third time. That God had to literally give folk a second touch, a third touch. God had to step back sometimes and allow folk to come to their own revelation. My prayer is, God, don't take a step back from me for me to get uh, clear about what you're up to. God, I want to hear it. I want to receive it. I want to embrace it. And it is in this regard, child of God, that I do believe that this moment, whether we're talking about war, whether we're talking about the ways in which violence is being unleashed through policy, whether we're talking about the ways in which our health and the information related to the mitigation and the, 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 the healing of the mind, the body, and the soul, the way all this is happening, I do believe there is an opportunity for you and I to interrogate, to ask questions, and to realize that, God, you are trying to show me something. I wonder if you could just put that in the chat one more time. Just holler at your neighbor right there in the virtual room and tell your neighbor, neighbor, God is trying to show you something. God is trying to give you a little bit of knowledge. God is trying to give you a little bit of information to round out that which you started with and help you have a fuller appreciation of the activity of God in the world. Come on, pat yourself on the chest and say, God is trying to show me something. And so as we stated in the text, you have both Moses in the Torah, in the, in the, in the Jewish scriptures. You had Jesus in the, the, the Gospels, in what we could know as the Christian scriptures, the New Testament. Both of them having to deal with a people who were familiar with God's activity, but were not fully uh, able to ascertain what God was up to. God leads the children of Israel out of Egypt, but yet the Egypt was not yet out of the children of Israel. So God had to give them what? A little bit of guidance. 
God had to give them some instructions. But as we read in the text, in the verses preceding, that the law is not what gives life. It is the spirit. And so for many of us, we have to ask ourselves, God, even as I get the knowledge, even as I get the information, what role is the spirit having to help me make sense of what I'm learning? And I'm not talking about the spirit in this kind of esoteric, ambiguous spooky subjectivity way i'm talking about the role the work the power of the holy ghost do i have anybody in the house today that still believes that the power of the holy spirit can lead you and guide you and guide us into all truths there is a power that has come into our lives that gives us the ability not just to understand but also to do that's why the scripture says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, freedom, not liberty and freedom to just sit there, but liberty and freedom to be, to do, to act. And I do believe that there are opportunities in this season for you to do something you've never done before. I do believe there are moments in this season of your life where you can act in ways you've never acted before. I believe that even in the midst of all of these trials, that the spirit is, 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 is pulling some of us out of our comfort zones to take a step we've never taken before. Do I have a witness in here that believes the spirit is pulling you? The spirit is pulling you, pulling you out of your complacency, pulling you out of your despair, pulling you out of your paralysis, pulling you out of the misinformation, the disinformation, the spirit is pulling us. And the question is, as the spirit pulls, will we follow or will we resist? How many of us are comfortable staying in the place of misconception, staying uh, under the, the hypnot hypnotism of the deceptor or, or resisting the power and the promise of the revelation. I want you to know that there is an opportunity for us to take the step beyond our comfort zone into a place that will open up a whole new world, a whole new uh, sensibility. Oh, come on, somebody holler. Come on, take the step, take the step, take the step. And so a few things that I'll, I'll unpack for the next few moments that, that help you and I appreciate that we must not miss what God is trying to show us. I often believe that deception, it shows up in at least two ways. Deception shows up uh, in, a, in a posture of positionality. And it also shows up in a posture of intentionality. What do you mean, Pastor Mike? Well, I do believe that a deception when we start talking about this idea of being positioned or situated in relationship to the truth or reality with only partial information, we can indeed develop misconceptions just because we don't have either the right information, enough information, or our process of discerning the information we have. It leads us to form a certain kind of, of, of belief or perception that is not grounded in truth. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. And man, when, when the writer talks about a veil had been placed over their minds. How many of you know some of us have veils that have been placed over our eyes? And some of that is informed by who we listen to and who we watch and what we read. And, and these veils can often cause us to, to filter out the transcendent and the mystery that is God's activity in the world. I want you to know, child of God, that what God is up to in your life may not always make sense uh, when you punch it into the Pythagorean theorem. It may not always make sense according to the ge ge geometry and trigonometry and physics formulas uh, that you may learn in your classrooms. It may not always line up with some of the, the rules of grammar, amen, and, 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 and the literature uh, that you may find in research method uh, and reviewed, peer-reviewed essays. How many of you know that there's some things that God has done in your life that didn't always make sense because... 
Uh, you know, you realize that that God does not always act within the boundaries. Lord, have mercy of what we call scientific methods. But it is not an excuse for us to be reckless then in our negligence. And sometimes we attribute to God what is really our ignorance and misconceptions. Oh, yes. Uh, there's all kind of misconceptions running around. Uh, you know, this has been Black History Month and we've been celebrating uh, the, the achievements of, of, of African-Americans, black folks uh, this whole month. And I, I've been so, 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 so befuddled by those who who make these claims that Black History Month was was thrust upon us in the shortest month of the year. Amen. People saying, oh, they gave us the shortest month of the year to focus on black history. And I ask folk, man, have you have you actually studied the origins of Black History Month? That Black History Month wasn't thrust upon us by some Eurocentric, uh, uh, imperialistic, dominating country or government. But Black History Month arose and emerged out of Carter G. Woodson's declaration of a Negro Appreciation Week in 1926. And Carter G. Woodson uh, famously said, if, if a person does not have a sense of their history, then they will find it difficult to chart forward a black future that is filled with life, hope, and vitality. I want you to know that our Black History Month is not something that was given to us. It was something that had its origins in Carter G. Woodson's appreciation in 1926 that there needed to be some time set aside. And why did he choose February? He didn't choose it because it had a short month. It, he chose it because he wanted to resonate uh, and fall during the time of Frederick Douglass's birthday. And many of you may or may not know who Frederick Douglass is, but you ought to. He was a revolutionary Christian or Christ follower who would declare the contradictions of American Christian faith and that which is found in the biblical text as a revolutionary liberatory force. And he, he was one of these folk who understood that what it means to be faithful, it means to display and expose the deceptions of a society and a way of life that would say we are the land of the free and the home of the brave, but we still have folk in chains and shackles and act in ways that are cowardly and without honor. So misconceptions, people walking around thinking that Black History Month uh, was thrust upon us when you don't understand that it was actually emerging out of a certain kind of acknowledgement, a sense of agency and self-determination. Why is that important? Because sometimes our misconceptions need to be confronted and corrected. So we do not then continue to spread and evangelize these misconceptions. How many of you know there are lots of misconceptions in the world around race and around gender and around the way we uh, should act in an economy? There are lots of misconceptions around the use and the role of violence and war. There are lots of misconceptions around some of our theological uh, uh, formations and, and edicts. And I believe that God is trying to help some of us to confront our misconceptions about ourselves. Who told you that you weren't beautiful? Who told you that you weren't smart enough? Who told you that you did not belong here? Oh, I want you to know when you internalize a misconception, you shrink yourself into someone else's uh, 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 creation for you. And, and I want you to know, child of God, you are not meant to fit in the truncated, shrunken creations of other human beings when the divine, the eternal one has created you to be as big as you can for the glory and the praises of our God. Oh, yes. Uh, the question you must ask yourself then is how do my misconceptions impact the way I make meaning for myself? How do these misconceptions impact the way I make meaning for those around me and us? How do my misconceptions drive my inability to literally 
see and capture that which God is trying to show me. Oh, Lord, help me. Lord, I, I don't want to be someone driven by my own misconceptions. How many know your misconception can cost you an opportunity? A misconception can cost you a relationship. A misconception can cost you your job. It can cost you your own well-being. Child of God, whatever you do, confront and correct your misconception. The second thing that I think is worthy to lift up when we talk about misconceptions, we must appreciate that deceptions are not benign. They are indeed intentional. That deceptions are misconceptions with bad intent. While a misconception can be the result of one's own internalized discernment process, a deception, at least in this context that I'm speaking today, is about the, the willful and active intent of things outside of you or people, persons, ideas outside of you that desire to mislead you, to mislead me, to mislead us. And there are a lot of deceptions out there. Mis misconceptions may be a bit more passive and invisible, but there are active deceptions out there that are seeking to cause you to take roads and pathways that lead you away from God, lead you away from your purpose, lead you away from life. And I want you to know that when you find yourself uh, caught in a deception, you must first learn to expose it. And then you must reject it. Deceptions must be exposed and they must be rejected. You can't play around with deceptions. You can't play around with folk who like to use deceptions to create confusion or blindness that accumulates power to themselves. Deceptions are driven by manipulators, by slick folks who know how to tell lies and, and work in mendacious and diabolical ways to cause them to be the arbiter of truth and reality. A deception is something that, that causes you to literally believe a lie, to swallow that which is not true and then make an argument for it to be true. The scripture talks a lot about deceptions and deceptors. Talks a lot about Satan, the devil, Beelzebub, Lucifer, pick one of them names, praise God. Being the, the, the chief deceiver, the, the father of lies. That, that person who, who is actively walking through the course of your life seeking to make you believe that which is not true. I mean, a deception is much more diabolical than a misperception, a misconception, because a misconception you can figure out through a different process of discernment, but a deception requires you to actually detox yourself from that thing which you have created to be normative in your mind, normative in your thought process. You have to find the source of that deception and root it out so you will not continue to be caught in the web. Whew. Lord, help me today. The web of somebody else's deception. I want you to know white supremacy is deception. I want you to know that, 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 that America being a post-racial society is a deception. I want you to know that continuing to invest in war and violence is a deception. I want you to know that there are kinds of deceptions that will literally cost you your future. But God is calling some of us to expose those things and to reject those things. God is asking you today who and what have been the source of some of these deceptions in your life. I tell you, some of us uh, un do not fully understand how the deceptions that cause us to kill one another, to maim one another, to assault one another, to pass policies that make you believe you're protecting someone when you're actually causing harm. 
I think of what's happening in Texas and I think of what's happening in Florida where these assaults against LGBTQ youth and families are, are attempting to become mainstream through state policy. And, and I tell folk, you know, your theological views about certain things ought not become the law of the land. I mean, think about how some of your theological views around certain things have changed over time. Think about how some of our ideas of the world have changed over time. And yet right now we are seeking to weaponize the differences between folks in their human sexuality as a cause to then label people abusers and, and, and stick the violence of the system on them. Oh, child of God, there must be a better way. The scripture says, come, let us reason together. We ought not use violence in any form to create conditions for those who are already in places of peril and vulnerability to now have to war against the powers of the state. No, we as a people must ask ourselves, where are deceptions arising? And how can we then cause ourselves to not be agents of deception. And then finally, child of God, revelation <clears throat> is such an important uh, capstone to this conversation because where there are misperceptions, where there are misconceptions, where there are deceptions, the remedy for these things are often revelation, divine injection of transcendent truths that you may not be able to ascertain on your own, but if you have an encounter with the Almighty God, if you have an encounter with the love and the power of God, as seen through God's work in nature, as seen through God's work in people, as seen through God's work in yourself, how many of you know that there is an opportunity for you and I to have a revelation that allows you and I to embrace a form of living that you may never have dreamed of. I believe some of us need to ask ourselves, God, how can I become more open to your revelation? How can I become more open to the ways in which you seek to help me move beyond the limitation of my deceptions and my mis? conceptions. God is calling some of us to make a trip like he took his disciples. He had to take them away from some crowds. Sometimes your revelation is connected to your alone time with God. Sometimes your revelations are, will be triggered and catalyzed by the time you spend with God in prayer. Sometimes your revelation will be catalyzed by the ways in which you and I can help ourselves. Uh, as the scripture says, uh, Jürgen Moltmann says, where there is no revelation, there will be I'm sorry, where there is no need, there will be no revelation. And I do believe that some of us uh, need to get more in touch with some of the needs in our lives. Because when there is a need, God says, I will send a revelation. At the nations, he's one of my favorite African church fathers from the fourth century. This is what he says, that we don't know God in his essence because it is unknowable, unfathomable by humanity. But we do get to know God through God's actions for they reach down to us. Think about that. That I may not be able to explain the inner workings of God, the essence and the makeup, though the materials that 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 make God who God is. Uh, but I sure enough can learn about God through the revelation of God's act activity in my life uh, and I want you to know child of God that God wants to reveal God's self uh, God wants to disclose God's self uh, God wants you to not be in a fog about what God is doing in your life uh, uh, some of us have endured COVID and have seen death and sickness closer to us than we've ever seen before uh, but I still believe God wants to reveal God's self as your Jehovah Rapha, as the one who heals you. How many of you know 
There are still maybe times where your provision is getting low, but God still wants you to know him as God reaches down to you as your Jehovah Jireh, meaning he will provide. Do I have a witness that can say that my mind during this season has been confused and I've been full of depression, but God is revealing God's self in the midst of my circumstance as my Jehovah shalom which is my peace and when I can't figure out all the different ways that God seeks to show up I've been given a name that I can call anytime but uh, I feel a little churchy in a virtual church today. Yeah. Do I have anybody in the virtual sanctuary that knows the one name you can call? Uh, when I, I can't get Jehovah Shama out, uh, when I can't get Jehovah uh, Rapha out and Jehovah Nisi out, when I can't get all of these nice, eloquent words out, uh, there's one name that I've been given above heaven uh, and below heaven that I can call and that name is Oh, come on, put it in the chat, Jesus. I want you to holler out the name of Jesus this week. In the midst of your misconception and deception, in the midst of your challenge, your struggle, and your trial, when you are watching the news and the terror that is flying by day and night, don't get bogged down in the wickedness of it, but holler out the name of Jesus. Uh, Jesus, I call on you when things are falling apart. Uh, Jesus, I call on you when things uh, are at their worst. Jesus, I call out to you because uh, I know you will show up uh, and give me a strength I did not know I had. Uh, it's the revelation for me child of God uh, it's the revelation in this season God show me something uh, and I found that God when I ask God to show me something God will say well show me what I'm working with uh, God will tell me show me what I'm working with McBride uh, do you got any faith do you got any hope do you got any love do you have any peace show me Show me what I'm working with. Uh, and if you can show God what you're working with, uh, how many know God can take that little that you have? Uh, God will take that little on your school job. Uh, God will take that little in your classroom. God will take that little in your office, that little in your business, that little in your relationship, that little in your own mind, in your spirit, that little in the political space, that little in the justice work. God will take that little and make it much because the revelation of God is always more than enough and this is what God wants to show us that we are connected to more than enough while we rest while we heal while we refresh God wants to show us that there's more to us and what we see with our naked eyes. And the work, our work, is to literally ensure that our journey to revelation ensures that we confront and correct misconceptions. We reject and expose deceptions. And we embrace and remain open to revelation. Take a few moments with me, child of God, and let's pray. Let's ask God, God, where in my life do I need to be open to your revelation? God, I pray, Lord, for those who are incarcerated today. I lift up the name of Julius Jones. I lift up the name of so many others we're in relationship with in our families, David Hill, so many, God, who find themselves locked in cages behind prison walls. They are not forgotten by us, God. I pray for the unaccompanied migrant children that are still in camps. I pray for the Haitians and the other uh, African undocumented immigrants and loved ones at the borders, Lord God, still, Lord, uh, 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 finding themselves caught in these systems, these, these meandering, winding systems of, of unjust and unequitable immigration policies. God, we lift them up to you today. We lift them up to you today because, God, we know that 
you are near them. When we are afar, when our memories and our circumstances and our work overwhelm us and we cannot stay in a place of advocacy, of, of fierce intervention, God, we depend on your spirit, your presence to be there. We depend on your spirit and your presence to animate faithful ones to minister to the incarcerated, faithful ones to minister to the undocumented. And at times, those faithful ones will be us. God, we lift up, Lord, our families, our networks, the schools, Lord God, shutting down in Oakland. We lift up, Lord God, all these expressions of, 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 of scarcity, Lord God, and, and, and mismanagement, Lord God, that caused the, the poor and the vulnerable among us, Lord God, to, to be caught in systems of inequality God we ask you Lord help us even as we analyze the causes of this to not be led and driven by misconceptions we pray for those Lord God who are still finding Lord God a prison of misinformation and disinformation related to COVID-19 and they're being deceived Lord God they're being trivialized Mass mandates, Lord God. People showing up, Lord God, acting violent and unsavory in school board meetings and, and, and restaurants and, and political spaces all across the country. God, they have been deceived. We pray, Lord God, for the oligarchs and the tyrants among us, Lord God, in political spaces, governmental spaces, heads of state, in countries in every hemisphere. God, the world seems to be teetering on the brink of disaster, and yet in the midst of this teetering, I still believe you're taking some of us to mountaintops to unveil your glory. Why, God, so we can continue as both individuals and your church to be transformed into the image of your glory. Bless us as your people. Strengthen us as your people. Give us what we need to confront misconceptions, to reject deceptions, and certainly, God, to embrace revelations, the revelation of your goodness, of your love, of your salvation. And we'll say thank you, Lord. Take a few moments and just thank the Lord. Take a few moments and just declare, God, that I will be an agent of peace and healing. I will be a vessel of honor. I, God, will... Lord, be a tool in your hand to restore, to redeem, to renew, to heal, to refresh that which has been harmed by the fallen systems of this world. And we'll say thank you, God, for the power that you have given to us. May we not miss what you're showing us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you, people of the way. Be on the look for a revelation this week. A revelation of God's goodness and kindness and peace. A revelation of God's healing, God's sustaining. Don't miss what God is trying to show you. God bless.